Hello. Hello to everybody uh, and welcome to the second installment of the Merriam-Webster book thing. Uh, I'm Ammon Shea. Uh, the fellow in the purple shirt is Neil Servan, uh, mm -hmm. an editor at Merriam-Webster. And we are beyond delighted today to be joined by Elizabeth McCracken. Uh, who is the author of numerous works. Most recently, you all know, I'm sure, The Souvenir Museum, which is the book that we have been reading for our monthly book club. So welcome, Elizabeth, and thank you again for joining us. I'm uh, so delighted to be here. Great. Um, so I'm, I'm sure that we, we've mentioned this to you before, but the, the way that we try to make this slightly different than a typical book event is that um, we're lexicographers, or some of us pretend to be, that's me. Um, and so we try to focus the discussion on language. So it can be about really anything that you want it to be about. Um, but our focus in looking at your book is, is linguistic in nature um, and, and, and all that that entails. Um, we're not concerned with grammar, we're concerned with just the beauty and the kind of foibles of the English language. Um, which I have to say your, your book really has in spades. Uh, so I, I wanna just dive right into to, to one subject, which is, um, uh, I guess it's word choice in a way, but it's, um, and, and several readers wrote, wrote to us asking about this. And um, I, I'm gonna use um, a kind of technical lexicographic term here, which is in asking this question, which is that when you, search for a word and you don't find the right word do you just make shit up because you have these beautiful <laughs> words that i've never seen any place else and and i can only imagine that they spring from your imagination so you know um I, i'm trying to think of uh cast offery is is a great example uh of one um it was uh cowheadedness smithish unpassported interlopingly, sing-songy, or puffinosity. Um, do you look for a word first? And if you don't find it, say, ah, screw it, I'll make my own. Or do you go in deciding I'm gonna put my own word in there? I feel like for all of those the words you just listed, I knew that there wasn't a word. I have to say one of the, I'm in, I have to apologize. I'm in my campus office and it's very hot. So over the course of this talk, I'm going to get damper and damper. Um, it's going to be like flash dance, but really, really slow. And by the end, I'm just going to be soaking and more disgusting, let's be honest. Um, but one of the reasons why I came here is because I'm surrounded by all my beloved reference books here. And this is my new Roger's thesaurus. Um, and when I was in graduate, which I love, um, when I was in uh, graduate school, we were always told that we shouldn't use the thesaurus because if we didn't know a word, that meant we shouldn't use it. And I love a thesaurus. I used to be a, a librarian. Um, I love reference books of all kinds. But also I know sometimes there's a word that I want that doesn't exist. I mean, like, like puffinosity. I'm pretty sure, I do really like to look up and there's probably a bunch of examples in the book. I do like to look up adjectival forms of animals. So bovine, ovine, lupine, lapin. Um, I love those words, but I was pretty sure there might be one for, for puffins. Um, but in that case, it's a, it's a noun anyhow. So I just, uh, yeah, I just, uh, and, I, and I will make absolutely anything an adverb, like interlopingly. Yeah, sure. Be shame well about. It, 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 what's, what's so lovely about it, I think, is that it's, it's, it's inventive with a kind of a whiff of the self-explanatory. So it's not stopping the reader and sending them to like, what the hell is that word? Um, you know, an example of that, this is a word which I think is lovely and I, I like it mainly for the definition, which is now gone, I think, which was uh, peristorotic, a peristorotic, which I think a, a earlier edition of the Oxford English Dictionary defined as suggestive of pigeons. And I thought, well, that's a lovely, lovely word. I mean, who doesn't want to come across something that's suggestive of pigeons, but it does interrupt the flow of your reading if you have to put down your book and kind of go elsewhere. And these words that you've come up with, they, they serve a purpose and they, they kind of tickle the imagination, but they don't in any way derail the narrative, which I, I thought was really lovely. I should say that 
as I was reading, I was having, having the same um, reaction as you, Anne, and there were all these beautiful words that I was coming across. And as a lexicographer, one of the first things I am trained to do when I'm reading something uh, is when I encounter a word that I just think is new, it strikes me as new, it strikes me as interesting, we are trained, we underline it, we make a citation, and that citation goes to uh, uh, a database in our files, and that's what we consult when we look at the dictionary. Um, I was citing everything when I was re reading this book, and I um, found words in there that I, I would stop to look up, and sometimes they weren't even in a dictionary at all, and yet I didn't feel like I needed to look it up because I didn't know what it meant. I knew what was being intended by the word you were using, even if it wasn't an established word in the dictionary. I think my favorite example might be um, in the Irish wedding story. There's a, a scene where someone, uh, one of the uh, guests are crying or being, it has to be comforted. And because she said her grown gone children hadn't come. Gone is spelled G-A-W-N. And that's a word I'm like, is that a real word? I, don't, I had to look it up. I didn't see any definition. It wasn't in the OED. And yet I'm thinking gone is sounds like gone G-O-N-E. They're gone. They're gone from the home. They didn't come back. It felt, it had this poeticness about it. Grown, gone children. It, it sounded right to their dialects too. And I just like, how did you land on that? <laughs> I do even remember at this point, it's just, there felt like a lot of decision might've gone into it, but it also just sounded so natural. Well, first of all, and I don't mean to be pushy, but since I'm talking to two lexicographers, like if any of the words that aren't in the dictionary that appeal to you could be put into the dictionary, <laughs> me is the first uh, instance. This is that, how you get the ball rolling. So yeah. all the immortality I would ever need. <laughs> all really, I only write fiction in the hopes that someday I'll end up in some reference books. Um, well, you know the right people now. So there you, there you go. I once jokingly offered to give Justin Kaplan, the editor of the uh, of Bartlett's quotations, fifty bucks to put me in, but he was too honest and he wouldn't do it. Um, that, I mean, that particular one is just a spelling of the way posh English people say gone. Mm -hmm. um, and it seemed, but the way they, they almost sort of jokingly say gone. Um, mm -hmm. And I may have even seen, seen it transposed that way in some fiction at some point, but, but maybe not. But, I, but I've heard people say gone and then they'll most sort of jokingly say gone. I cannot do a fake good fake English accent. Uh, and so, yeah, it seemed, it seemed right there. There was um, <clears throat> a story I heard about the, the poet Auden who was living in Oxford at the time that, the, um, that they were doing one of the revisions of the Oxford English Dictionary, the, the supplements. And, 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 and the OED spends a huge amount of their time create, you know, collecting citations from, from writers and doing it in a very chronological fashion. And they used to have a thing that they try to get a citation for every 50 or 100 years. And so what Auden used to do is um, he was friends with the editor of the OED at the time. And so he would look through the OED to find words that hadn't been used for hundreds of years. And then he would write and publish poems with those words specifically in them. When they were published, he would bring them to the editors and say, now you need to put this one in because I've used it. And he, I think he did get, get himself kind of shoehorned into the OED a couple of times that way. So, um, so it's a grand I tradition. Have to again. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, this, I, this is why we don't have poets on on the show, and <laughs> they're too but, much trouble. Yeah. But I, again, what, what what's so lovely about this is that it, I, I think it takes a lot of work to make something kind of um, go smoothly like this. Um, and you know, you can find weird words if you want, and they're, they're, the English language is is absolutely riddled with obscure, big polysyllabic Latinate Greek origin words. And so one that, that, that came to mind for me was um, because of the end of the, the story, which I loved, um, of Mistress Mickle. See, it's at the very end where the, 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 the titular Mickle uh, 
has this unfortunate incident where she defecates in her pants all of a sudden. And, um, and there is a word for that. It only came up in one dictionary in 1623 by uh, Henry Cockrum, which was, um, he had two words kind of synonymous. One was bulbitate and the other was imbulbitate. I don't think we really need both of them. <laughs> and he defined it as to befilth one's breach. Um, so the English language actually has a word for crap in your pants, um, albeit one that has not been used for 400 years now. But I, I'd like to think that in your writing, you would have come up with something a little more kind of elegant, like pants shitting or something like that. You would have somehow <laughs> adverb that into something that's funny and clear and yet also endlessly descriptive. So um, all, all, all the words that you've come up with so far, I think are, are lovely. And, and yes, we're gonna, we, we are putting them into the files. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Although I do also, I love arcane words too. I don't think they're, I don't think they're good to use in fiction if they're just a, just a display of, you know, I know this word and you don't, but, but I do like arcane words that you can figure out what they mean in context or somehow somebody explains or. Well, I think the fact that, you know, so many of these stories are kind of destination stories. They take place in all these different beautiful settings you know, you've got Ireland, you've got England, you've got Texas, and um, uh, I think there's one in like the Netherlands. And it seems like you did an amazing job of like formulating that language uh, to remind us where we were. You know, um, like the Irish, the, the uh, Irish wedding story. It's like they it, they put you in the snug. You know the, the the host. We're going to put you in the snug. That's another word I had to look up, and it was like it was this beautifully British word. You know, because <laughs> the British have like, words that start like end in G, like bog and and uh, 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 and there's others I think that are coming to me. But snug just kind of fell into that pattern, and I I thought there was just like a really incredible job of selecting language that sort of reminded where we were. Um, and I, I think another one I loved was the Texas story with the water park. Uh, on the first line you talk about, um, you, you say Shaw on saltwater taffy. Right. And it, you don't say chew, which I think in, in the dictionary, if we look up Shaw, it's just a synonym of chew. We don't give it any different definition and yet Shaw was a word that sounded like it certainly belonged there because it's in Texas. I think Texas, I think of Shaw, I think of like beef jerky. I think of tobacco, you know, I don't think of dinner. Uh, so it, 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 it was like, there were examples of that where I thought that I could tell that there was that selection of language that was there that really just did a good job of immersing us in this setting, wherever the different settings were. Right, that was the same story. I, I remember that you noted that that tube is a verb in Texas. So there, there was a lot of a lot of kind of gentle underpinning of location. I thought with your word choice. Um, quick uh, comment. We have a comment rather than a question, and this is one of those rare occasions where the comment rather than a question is great. Uh, this is a, a, a comment from a reader named Marianne, who says, "As an editor, I especially love those moments where her narrators ponder words and usage. Examples between the small of his back and the nape of his neck, though his body had no other nape and no other small, which is really lovely. And was he Joanna's common law ex-husband or ex-common law husband?" Um, and 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 that that reminds me in a in a, in a way of uh, in, in addition to you kind of creating words or as we say in the office making shit up. Um, <laughs> what was also I thought really uh, quite elegant was just a kind of gentle shifting of existing words. Um, sometimes a mother and child would walk by her table, and Lenora could see the rictus of judgment on the mother's face. And rictus, of course, referring usually to the kind of death grin that sets in from rigor mortis. But it's entirely appropriate here. It means what you want it to mean, and it really um, conveys an image beautifully. So um, and that's, I think, how language can shift: is people doing what they want with it. Um, we do have an anonymous question, and this is a question rather than a comment. Um, somebody wants to know if you have a favorite word. Oh gosh, do I have a favorite word? I was going to say that for me, the difference between cha and chew is chew is something you do every day. 
and you only chaw on special occasions or particularly. Um, I love the word eponymous. I also love the word, uh, the, fra the phrase, the titular mickle, of course, made my heart sing. Um, and I'm trying to think, I mean, I have the words that I overuse, um, which are the words that are most likely to send me to the thesaurus. Like tender is one of my absolute favorite words. And I'm always using it. And it is the first word that I have to go through in anything that I write and go, no, not everything can be tender. Really only one or two things in an entire book can be tender. Um, that is the adjective tender, not the, not the verb tender. Sure. Um, yeah, it probably shifts from day to day though. The eponymous always sticks. I think I remember learning what eponymous meant and being, I mean, when I was young and being so thrilled there was a word for that. Right. It's a good you have a lot of those memories where you remember how you learned a word? Yeah, posthumous yeah, too. Only for a few, but I think with eponymous, I think it was the REM Greatest Hits album. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, sorry. It's yeah, for me, it's usually when I, it's, they're all unhappy memories because I've learned it through some, some form of public humiliation where I just get it wrong, um, <laughs> which my, my entire history is rife with. Um, in writing this, did you, once you sent it in, did you have any, any pushback or did you have any like knife fights with the copy editor over word choice or, or structure or anything? Or was it, was it a, a kind of friendly back and forth? Yeah, I don't think so. I, I mean, every now and then, I might have gotten a pushback and and I, you know, I worship copy editors. Sure. I, I worship copy editors and I also delight in disagreeing with them as well. And in fact, anytime I'm copy edited, I want I actually want somebody to to go too far so that I can disagree, but that I also know that other sentences of mine that I've read so often that I can't see see a clear problem with. I want those those addressed. So I'd always I always prefer to be over copy edited, um, and will say with you know with great certainty, sometimes with a, in a first person narrator, when they say oh that is correct instead of which, and I'm like yes I know that 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 it is, but in this case the person is definitely saying which and not that. Right. Um, but I I think I don't think I've ever. I think for anything that I've ever coined and it's only minor like I am not in many ways and this is self-evident so I don't need to really say it I am not James Joyce um and I feel like the I'm not I'm not pushing the bounds of of um what's sensible I think when I when I coin words so I, I think I generally haven't I haven't gotten pushback we, we have a, a, a three-part question from Barbara she wants to know, I'm just going to read them all three and you can answer any and all of them. Uh, do you have English roots, a home there? She notes that your characters seem real and in depth. Since you live with them while creating them, do you ever think of your characters as real? And she wants to know if you are also an oral storyteller in your daily life. Let's see, I am married to an English person. Um, I, I lived, when I was a child, I lived in England for a year and um, my father was like to say that he was an Anglophile is putting it lightly. Um, even so, once I, I hitched my fortune to an actual English person and now we go and visit England all the time, I was astonished by what I didn't know about a country that I thought I knew pretty well. Um, and even still, he'll pronounce a word and I'll go, my first impulse is always, oh, you've never heard that word pronounced aloud and so you're pronouncing it incorrectly. Um, and now most of the time I, I look at him and say, do you guys really pronounce it that way? Um, so, so yeah, now I know England fairly well, I think. Um, I mean, not as, not as well as English people do. Um, I become incredibly fond of my characters and this is a strange book um, for me in that there are a lot of events in the book that are taken from my life and no characters and very few emotions that are mm -hmm. so like the Irish wedding is there's not a person in there who is from my actual life 
but there are a lot of things that are from my actual life. Um, that house, the cat and dog, being too, so tired that I left my door open on a rental car and a cat and dog spent the night during the rain uh, there. Um, and so, yeah, I, I wouldn't say they seem, they seem very dear to me, but they don't necessarily seem real to me, if that makes sense. Yes. And I can't remember the third part of the question. Are you an oral storyteller in daily life? Sometimes, but not particularly. Um, Deborah has a question. Assuming you read your books after publication, do you find yourself wanting to rewrite a sentence or wishing you had used a different word? Well, I don't, I certainly don't reread my own work for pleasure. I am now in the state where occasionally I'm reading passages aloud and yes, continually. I mean, it's shocking to me that sentences I think I've been over a million times, I think, oh, there's a repetition. I don't like that. Or, um, oh no, I could put that a better way, which is why I don't return to my work for pleasure. So there's this really, you know, I've, I've been publishing books for a while now. So there's this really nice thing where the older books sort of disappear into the distance. And I don't have to sort of think, oh God, I got that wrong. Now I can sort of think I did that I don't have to look at them and I can just think I did not I did my best at that time. Um, I, I have a question that's that's tangential to, to language, but um, I, one of the things that I noticed about a number of these stories, which I, I absolutely adored, was you were quite judgmental about a number of things. <laughs> um, nobody whose mother ever truly loved them has ever taken pleasure in playing the tambourine is, is, is a really horrible thing to say to anybody who loves the tambourine, but I think is deeply true. Um, you described, uh, you know, there they were, the, the pelicans, there they were, single file and exact military, even with the smug look of all pelicans. Um, so here you are uh, assailing all pelicans, um, pelicanhood. And the way you described uh, Vivaldi as the awful brightness of Vivaldi on the classical station, which I, I agree with 100%. Um, do people ever complain to you about making these kind of judgments within the book? Or is it seen as entirely part of the character? Because it doesn't seem to me to be part of the character. It seems to me to be part of the author. Well, the, the Pelican lobby is, is to, you, to, to use an English phrase, right browned off at me. <laughs> um, uh, I didn't know, and it's funny, every time I, I've had to reread that line about tambourine players and every now, every time I read it I think but maybe Davy Jones of the monkeys is, he's, he seemed to play the tambourine with love and joy and um it's funny because I do I, I don't get complaints about them they're the sort of thing that seem right to me when I write them I mean I'll stand by pelicans being smug I think that they are so I'm just I'm just gonna say it um and uh but I, but I, I sometimes read those things at a later time and think, I wonder why I felt that strongly about that. And part of it is, is, is that I'm, I mean, speaking of, of reference books, I really love books of aphorisms too. And so I sometimes, I mean, no doubt way too much like to write a sentence that sounds like it's true, even if I don't believe that it's true. That's, that's just aphoristic um, and, and pleases me. But I, but I also do feel that way about Vivaldi. It feels too. Yeah, I, that, that I wonder if what's right sticking through. out about what's sticking out about this is that I mean, I think almost all of the stories except for one are written in third person. That's right. You've got that kind of that authorial statement that's happening. You know, when you when you say this, is like, is it the character saying it? Is it is it the author as Ammon notes? Um, and so that kind of brings me brings up uh, the subject of my favorite story, which happens to be the it's not it's not you which is i think the only one in the book that's first person um and so we get the author's sort of you know, the idea being of course when you're reading a first person is that it's the author's selection of words even though with third person you know often there's such a thing as close third person where the narrator is selecting words that might be close to the author's sentiments or consciousness and yet i really loved her observations in that story as she's going around the hotel um, and where you kind of, 
you would think all the all the words that she's choosing are kind of informed by her past, informed by her mood, you know. So she's looking at the stiff Sputnikoid chandeliers, you know, and making this illusion. The story is supposed to be set in the '90s, and so she's thinking of the this time before of like the mid century, and and I guess that would lead to a question of when you are writing between first person and third person, how does that affect what you are trying to do when you get into the, the character's head or, and, and does that affect word choice? Does that, uh, is there a different mindset when you're writing? There is, that's such a good question. There is, I want to say, and it's ineffable and end of answer, but <laughs> it's something, there's something to ask. Um, Although it, it, it's hard to, for me to quite put my finger on it. Um, Cause for years I only wrote in the first person or mostly in the first person. My first book of short stories is entirely first person with one third person story. And then I wrote two first person novels. Uh, and the things that I'm working on right now since I finished the Souvenir Museum are both first person. And it's been interesting to me that has taken me a while to get back into it and to understand what it means to be writing in somebody else's voice. It's not, the confusion to me is not like the point of view, but to remember how people talk about themselves. Mm -hmm. And that, I, that, that may be the biggest difference that is, and it might seem really obvious, uh, but somehow I had to learn it over again, is that a first person narrator is talking about themselves and the third, when I choose third person, it's often because that person wouldn't talk about themselves or, or couldn't. The Souvenir Museum, the title story, I originally tried to write that in first person and it just didn't work for some reason. Um, and it had something to do with the main character. So I do, I do think word choice is part of that. And it may be that to some extent, I shifted to third person because I had friends going, this narrator would never use this word. And then I went, I'm going to use the narrator that can use any word they want to. Uh, but I also like, I like to write from the point of view of characters who, who might use those words. I don't know if that answers your question. It, feel, it feels very mysterious to me, the shifts between narrators. Well, I think it, I think it, it's at, kind of gets at the dilemma, you know, it's like you're, you're trying to, I think first person stories and third person stories, and I, I speak as someone who has tried to write myself and I, you know, written a few stories in first person and third person, and there's often the choice of how much of yourself you want to insert in the narrative, how much you trust to be in the head of the person if you want to do a first person narrative, and then having having these vocabulary you know th that you have to select when you're going with one char one character over another character or over a third person narration which you know to me really informs like what kind of person we we are listening to and so i think you know th there's possibly a, a way of saying it is you know, a first person narration is telling us a story a third person is really telling on someone else. And I, I was kind of struck by that in how um, in that first person, it was, there was this difference, like we saw where her eyes were going. Her eyes were going to the chandeliers. Her eyes were, were looking at the dollhouse bottles of bourbon. And it was totally true to her personality to, for her to make these observations. Um, and so I, I was just really, I guess, interested in what that can create in the reader's mind of the character rather than the third person kind of sitting over, kind of watching along, watching the characters along with the reader, you know, if that I, makes any sense. I will tell you that the minuscule word choice related thing in that story I'm most proud of which I don't think I could have gotten away with in the third person is all of the synonyms for small referring to various bottles in the hotel. There's yeah. pygmy, midget, dollhouse, vest pocket. There might be more as well. 
Um, this pocket's a good one. Yeah, I love this pocket. It's small. Yeah, one of the things that I that I noticed about or that I felt about this book, which which I really, um, and it's it's unusual for Neil and I to be so enthusiastic about anything in life, so let alone a book. <laughs> A little bit jaded. Especially at the same time. Right, I know. Um, but the, it was the, the way that, aside of the inventiveness of the language, the way that it was, um, in, in a word, it's elegant, but it's, I would say, more that you have a number of words which are just laden by that. That I, it, it feels like it's not, you're, you're using one word to kind of create um, this, this broad picture that's it's, it's like a subtext. And the, the example for me is uh, in the bird song from the radio. Those aren't frogs, said Marco. He was five, the age of taxonomy. And to me, the age of taxonomy is it's, it's a complete nonsensical thing unless you've known a five-year-old child and, and the way that they're ordering the world. And then it, it speaks of this really broad and complex thing, this, the, 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 the growth and, and intellectual development of a five-year-old child and all the, the kind of frustrations and wonderment that, that comes along with that. Um, and so I'm not going to ask you, how do you do that? Because that's just an absurd question. You, you do that through, through decades of painstaking work and adherence to craft, of course. You know. But what I, what I would ask is when you, then there is a shift when you're re replicating dialogue, often the word choice there is laden as well, but in a different way. Nobody says, um, oh, he's the age of taxonomy. You, you, you very much shift gears. So the, the words are no less kind of pregnant and gravid. And I was wondering, do you uh, find yourself operating as a kind of voyeur? Do you write down things that you hear people say? Do you steal snippets of conversation or is this entirely of your own imagination? I really almost never steal stuff that I hear. I know a lot of writers who love eavesdropping and those are people who love humanity. I am not. <laughs> There's people who go- You're in the right coffee. company. I'm just saying, yeah. <laughs> There's people who can go to coffee shops and write. My students uh, do this and they write brilliant stuff. And they, they say, you know, somehow the noise is interesting to me and you can hear the scraps. And I'm like, I, if I'm at a coffee shop, I can only hear the one idiot who's talking about his startup louder than anything else and piped into my head. Um, there are people who eavesdrop to great uh, effect and I'm not, I'm not one of them. Um, I'm not, I'm just, I'm, I'm much more likely to be wincing at the voices of uh, my fellow humans. Uh, and in, in, in the case of the, the, the frogs thing, um, it's a reference to that, that, I think it may be like Sergeant Pepper style um, fastenings on a cloak, those, those scroll work things that fasten with a, a loop and a, and a knot, um, which were everywhere in the 60s and the 70s. And my mother had capes with frog, that closed with frogs. And I remember, be, that's, that's an example of, of me remembering when I learned that term, it was when I was a kid and my mother said they're called frogs. And then I think I wrote the story when my children were five or one of my children was five. Um, and I thought, yes, that's what five-year-olds do. Um, so I, I can't say it's not that I, I don't pay attention, but particularly when I write dialogue, I am trying to remember the ways people talk, but not specifically what they say. So I'm always sort of interested in what the, what the rhythms are and the sort of general grammar, but I don't know that my dialogue sounds the way that people talk. It, I think it sounds the way my characters talk. That, that makes sense. I went to a, I was in a class once, a craft class about dialogue and uh, the exercise they, was the teacher had one of the kids uh, go up to, a, um, to the computer with a microphone and then have to tell a story of a dream that he had as a child. And he just kind of did this unselfconsciously. And then we had to like, we had to go back and repeat uh, we had to play back what was said and then put it into words on the page to see the rhythms of speech that you never would have thought took place in your mind as you're speaking. Um, and one thing I noticed was there was a lot of like uh, general to specific in, you know, when, when you're trying to describe something and it's like when I was 
when I was young, when I like, like maybe five or so, uh, there was this man, he was like a, a, a garbage truck driver or something. You know, there was always like kind of, you, you, pre, you put out the genus term and then you specify, which is what we do as lexicographers when we def define words. We're always like starting with a uh, more general and then get into specifics with qualifiers. Um, and so I, I was also, but the other thing I, I noticed when I was taking that class is that there was never a lot of content <laughs> to what was being said. It was just kind of like, it was a great way to learn the way people spoke, but then you have to then, you know, make the dialogue interesting enough to at least be worth reading. And that's not always going to be the same thing. Yeah. yeah. No, that's, that's, that's really interesting. I, I, I have to say that I don't, though I don't eavesdrop, the thing that I return to again and again to look at how people talk and specifically how they talk about themselves is I love oral histories, which have edited out quite often those things that get people on track and keep them specific. Um, but Working by Studs Terkel, you know, is one of the most important books in my, my writerly life because it's amazing just to see with with what specificity people talk about themselves, and also, you know, the the how interesting their their sentence structure is when they talk about themselves. Uh, we have another anonymous question here, which is um, a lot of the stories start in early drafts in a different place than they end up when they're finished, and so many of these stories seem to start about one thing and end up about another in delightful ways that I really love. Is there one that you can remember where it started for you and when in the writing process it changed to what it became? Can you recall the change or moment in the writing process that opened up the story to what it became? Well, often I can't remember. <laughs> I have a bad memory for unhappiness of any kind. And often I think, oh, the stories were always like this and, and then if I look back at early drafts, I see that I'm, I've just forgotten what I've done. But there, there are five stories in this collection that are that follow the same two characters, uh, a man and woman couple named Sadie and Jack. And um, the last story, which takes place in Amsterdam, across from the Anne Frank Museum, I, I often start to write stories, particularly for this collection, when I've been traveling with my family and we were in Amsterdam staying in a houseboat across from the Anne Frank house. And I took a bunch of notes for a story and I just couldn't figure out who the story was about. Uh, I had these vivid details, you know, what it's like to, to sleep on a houseboat that you think isn't moving and then you go into a stationary museum and the museum is moving up and down. Uh, the fact that you have to buy your tickets for the Anne Frank house way ahead of time, which we didn't know. Uh, and an event that happened to my daughter and husband when they tried to get into the Anne Frank house and a guard was about to let them in and a lady saw this happening and interrupted and then they couldn't go in. And we said to this woman, you ruined it. And this woman said, I didn't ruin it. Um, so I, I had these little pieces and then I, I wrote the five stories because uh, I was trying to finish the book uh, and I drafted all the stories very quickly and I had drafted four of them. And then I suddenly realized that these snippets that I had were about these characters that I already knew. And it was such a strange pleasure because I'd never done that before of taking these, these events and applying them to characters that I already knew. Something that I, I'd known that I wanted to write about, but I couldn't figure out what characters to put into it. And realizing that I had these characters that I'd already, I already knew a lot about by the time I got to that story. Uh, and that was probably the biggest, because I had, I just had sort of some things in pieces. Uh, and I think I also had one paragraph about a couple uh, for a story meeting outside of a giant puppet. And that's how I started writing the, 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 all of the stories because that happens to, the, to Sadie and Jack as well. And so I think that, yeah, that was the biggest, it was just pieces. And once I understand who it was in the story, I understood what happened in the story and I hadn't understood that. 
Earlier, you mentioned that as a, as a former librarian, you have this abiding love for, for reference materials. Do you have, um, do you have a preference for print? Our physical books are our, our online reference. When you're looking something up, do you go to one or the other? Do you eschew online resources or <laughs> a I, I don't, I don't eschew them, but I do prefer um, paper. And I'm one of those people that even though in every way electronic library catalogs are better, I do miss, I love serendipity that, that, the, that happens when you research on paper that is not possible um, when you do it electronically. I have over on my, I'm looking at my grandfather's 1927 OED, um, which came into my office and is stacked up, um, which I don't look at because I look at it online because I haven't got a bookcase built for my grandfather's OED. So they're inaccessible because they're in a giant tower at the moment. Um, but I I just, I love looking at an entire page at one time. I love that flipping through the, the, the stack of pages and seeing what I see. Uh, and I do really feel, I, I miss that when I look things up. So for, I don't think, I've just moved back into my campus office. so. I don't have and any of my my um, dictionaries to hand, except for I do have my my new Rogers to hand, and I can't. I, I have to say, especially an online thesaurus. I think it's just it's like looking at um, the Alps through a keyhole. I don't like it. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I should mention though the. Uh... I'm sure you're aware that that 1920s edition of the OED has a kind of raised type on the page, which is really a, a lovely tactile way of interacting with the text because you can kind of feel the words mm -hmm. rubbing against you. Um, but you can also uh, get that online. Um, someone has an anonymous question. Is there a process you go through when coming up with names for characters? It has varied through my life. Um, I, the, the last book I wrote, um, Bull Away, almost, which is a novel, almost all of the novels from, I mean, all of the names in that were taken from my, my grandfather was a genealogist, the grandfather who owned the OED, as well as a, a classicist. And I just went through some of his genealogies and picked out names that were extremely evocative and old fashioned and, and pleasing to me. Uh, and I used to, I mean, I used to be particularly bad at names and I would really just like look at my the books on my shelves and mangle some, but it's really amazing. I never wrote a character named Flannery O'Connor. I'm like, that's a good name. That's got personality. Uh, but since then I've gotten a little more, I've, I've, I've worked a little more to, to try to think of what, um, what it means to name something. I mean, maybe it's just the difference between having had children. I'm like, oh yeah, you should really be careful when you name a human being. And now I do it with some more care. I do sometimes write that if I hear a name that's good um, of somebody who is dead, I will write it down. There was a, a story which is possibly apocryphal of the, the, the great French novelist, George Simenon kept a, an entire filing cabinet full of uh, French phone books. Um, and when he needed names, he's turning out a book every two weeks. So he needs a huge number <laughs> that's of right. so You go in one and pick out a first name and go in another one and pick out a last name, just kind of smash them together, which seems not very romantic, but certainly has a, has a kind of effectiveness to it. And when you're George, when I was a teenage uh, book shelver, I remember shelving someone on and going, are you kidding me? <laughs> How many books could there possibly be? Yeah. Hundreds. Now we get that feeling with Nora Roberts uh, in my business. So. <laughs> uh, Ted has a question, which is, this is the version of the kill your darlings question. Do you ever edit out a flourish as too grand? Something like in the water park story, the parents quote, auguring their own child's future from your child's psychic entrails, which is wonderful. If so, what are your criteria for something being too much? Um, probably I have no standards for when something is too much. No, I do. I do edit stuff out. Uh, I mean, as you can tell, I, I sometimes do like the sort of 
making something formal as a joke and being, you know, uh, grander uh, than the context context suggests it should be. Uh, and I, I edit stuff out when, I mean, I feel like I know it. And, and all the time I will hit a line that I'm like, that is pretty and it adds no meaning whatsoever. Uh, and, and a lot of my revision is looking for words that add nothing to the sentence or add only, yeah, add no meaning. And by meaning, I can, I feel like tone can add meaning, like as in, in that line, Ted, if you're suggesting that I should have edited it out, um, that there's something that I love about Augur in that sentence, uh, because it's, it's a silly word to use. Um, and yet it feels like the right one to me. But I certainly use language that appeals to me at the time. And then I go back and think, yeah, you're just, you're just showing off or that doesn't really, it doesn't mean anything more than putting it more plainly. Yeah. Uh, by the way, I, 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 I'm, in, I'm entirely in favor of your use of adverbs, even though there's a kind of <laughs> standard writing guide of uh, advice of, of remove adverbs. And I, I, it was one of my favorite things I ever came across. I think it was Stephen King in his writing books had a long passage about um, how you never use, need to use adverbs, which was absolutely fucking chock full of adverbs, <laughs> you know, of course, because, you know, I mean, most of the people don't recognize the variety and, 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 and many vicissitudes in which the adverb can function. Um, I have strong feelings about adverbs. Apparently, and I think they're the so. I think they're I think they're the most maligned and most misused part of speech, and that when people complain about them, um, they shouldn't be complaining about all of them. But because they're a part of speech that people use automatically, that um, like whispered quietly, or they're they're using them in places where they're not adding meaning to the verb at all. That's why people dislike them. Whereas I like adverbs that contradict a little bit what they modify. And then I think they're, you know, they're beautiful and strange and, and they do, again, they add meaning. Um, I think a lot of people forget that adverbs are not there just to amplify, but to, to, ch to change or improve or undermine or something like that. <clears throat> sure, so he made his way tight roperly across the rocks. You're not, you know, it's 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 giving this whole kind of nuance to the sentence. It really informs the whole the whole sentence and the whole kind of feeling well, of this the evocative image too. Yeah, I and mean, right. it's like you've got this you you see the balance that he's trying to make as he's as he's doing this, and it's like the fact that you can just insert that word there and then create exactly that image that wasn't. I mean, just making his way across the rocks. You aren't. That's not enough. You've got to. You've got to find this way of of, uh, of connoting the balance, and 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 that just seems like a perfect like a perfect coinage, right? right. If, if you if you say he made his way across the rocks in the manner of one walking on a tightrope, <laughs> just oh, come on, that's, or that's even wild. in the manner of a funambulist, it's right. Not <laughs> right, right. That's like a definition, you know. In the that's a definition, like, right, right. So. Uh, Lisa wants to know if you use better read beta readers, familiar or non, for any part of your process. What do others think of your creative words? What do others think of my creative words? Um, I do use. I I I have people read my work, and it is um, essential. I'm I'm marveling over that last phrase because I think um, of the absolute terror of. Uh, waiting to hear from people uh, what they think about my work. And I'm sure that they lie to me a little bit to make the criticism uh, go down more easily. But yeah, I, I think that there are certain things that a writer just doesn't know, whether it's clear. I really, and in fact, I feel like if I only wrote so that I knew that my work was instantly legible, I wouldn't be able to write very well. I would be worried about, I, I, this is something I tell my students when, I, um, when I'm, I'm teaching that I, I, I personally don't worry about the reader because if you worry about what the reader is gonna make of something, 
the reader you make up is always a jerk and often doesn't understand and is complaining. Um, so that instead of that, I send it to several actual readers um, uh, who, you know, some of whom are writers, some of whom aren't. I work with um, a wonderful editor, Helen Atzma at um, uh, Echo Books. My agent, uh, Henry Dunow is a great reader. Um, uh, I had my friends both uh, Ann Patchett and Paul Sicky read this collection and, and, and other friends too. And it's, it's essential for me to have people read my work. Uh, at a, they don't read it early on because I have to remain full of delusions of grandeur while I'm actually working on something. But later on, just to make sure that I'm not being self-indulgent, which I'm likely to be, or I'm not being obscure, or I'm not, I haven't forgotten something. Um, I need readers to, to, to tell me where I've stepped wrong. You know, earlier, you mentioned that tender was, you thought, your most overused word. Do you, do you have a, a, any, any other words that, um, that you misuse on a regular basis? Are, that are I misuse? I feel words? like the, this feels like a trick question. Yeah, I can know. you tell me what they are? <laughs> are I could rephrase it as are there words which you often find you have to go look up before you, no matter how many times you. I you don't know. It's funny. This is not answering. This is a total dodge of your question. But totally in fine. the thing I'm working on right now, I have a uh, character give a strenuous defense of the old um, uh, definition for transpire because I remember my father explaining to me that transpire means come to be known, you know, breathed across. Right. And every time I hear somebody use it as happen, I think, no, we have a word that means happen. We have no other word that means transpire. Uh, that doesn't answer your question. I'm trying to think of words that I know that I misuse. I, I, they're ones I know I use way too much. Right. But, um, well, what else do you What else do you feel like you use too much aside of tender? Uh, all and I don't think this is unusual. All words referring to scale, uh, tiny, enormous, um, gargantuan. I mean, like I'm always looking up. That's one of the reasons why I entertain myself in that story with many synonyms for small. All house bottles of bourbon. Yeah. yeah. Pale. Um, lovingly. Already, I love the word already. Those are all fine choices. Neil, Neil, as, as Neil actually writes definitions, I don't. I, I do I do research, but I, I don't. They don't let me near the writing of them, which is a good thing for all concerned. But uh, lexicographers have to kind of say the same thing again and again, which is the meaning of the word. Do you find that are, are there words which you try to shy away from in definitional language? In definitional language, um, well, you're always oh, for that. You have free reign to use of or pertaining to as many times as you want. Right. Well, that's the whole idea of what defining is, right? Defining is making something distinct from something else. And oftentimes you need to find that select word that has just a bit of nuance that is different from a word that is used in another definition because you're trying to create that distinction between the two entries. Um, and yeah, oftentimes it, it will be an adverb that does so. It will be a, um, a word that you might not come to your own vocabulary, but you have to go search and find. Um, and so, I mean, I guess for you know, writing definitions, you know, for the purpose of making distinctions, which I think is different from maybe what a prose writer is necessarily trying to do, unless that distinction has a purpose to the narrative. You know, there's there's different like functions, I suppose, that you, what you're thinking about when you're trying to write, when you're trying to search for that word in the definition that maybe a prose writer doesn't always have to consider. <clears throat> now, you know, somebody just wrote in a, with a question about a, a pet peeve, but that just reminded me of something. So you mentioned this, this, this kind of feeling you have about transpire based on your father's use of it. Do you have, do you have grammatical or usage-based peeves? Do you have um, words which you, you feel offended by the use of? 
our, our constructions. Does, does, the, uh, does the, the sentence terminal preposition raise your hackles or anything? Since no, that, do does, that doesn't at all. Um, most of things that I don't like have to do with losing a word that, a particular word that, uh, um, when like literally, I understand that it has changed and yet there is no replacement for literally especially to make jokes or you know so that that is probably my my biggest unhappiness that literally now no longer means literally i have let go of correcting all right uh because it's now in the dictionary as one word so i respect the dictionary um and i don't correct it i hate gift as a verb um used in otherwise um, non uh, prose that's tr striving not to be particularly tied to a time. Because it still, it's still, even though I know that it's been used as a verb in history, it's still, it's Six, smacked seven, of commercials to me. Yeah. Well, you talk about being a, a, a teacher, a writing instructor, and uh, that kind of is a different you know, puts a different thought in mind as you're writing, right? Because you're you're trying to, you have these students that you're trying to help them write and be true to themselves and, you know, use language that sounds true to what they are trying to do. Is there a lot of like, I don't know, how, what, is there a lot of thinking like, you know, you look for places where they might be doing something that you would not, be doing in your own writing or something that sounds wrong in language that might actually work in your writing that doesn't sound true to theirs? Is there, uh, I guess, a, an approach you take when you are teaching writing and like not necessarily correcting language, but judging when a, write, a writer is not being true to themselves in their language? How do you take that approach? How do you like identify that? I guess. You know, 100% in everything, language, form, character, I always want to meet my students at where they're, where they are, where their highest aspirations are. And to never, one of the th things I say all the time to graduate students, uh, especially ones who really love language, is that it's true. Sometimes they have to learn to apply some rigor to their sentences, but they're the ones, if they're real stylists, they're the ones who are gonna have to figure out that rigor that I hate. This used to happen, I think, in graduate workshops where somebody will go, well, I really have to break the back of your language and then you can build it back up again. Um, and I don't think that that's use useful. And it also, you know, I love wild and strange and idiosyncratic language um, as a, as a teacher and a reader, it's one of my absolute favorite things. So you have to, and again, that's not so much, that's not so different from plot and, um, and tone and everything form when it comes to teaching is that you have to look, okay, what is this, what's this language trying to achieve and how do we figure out how to get it to achieve that? And so sometimes it will be like the metaphors are fantastic, but they're overextended or they're fantastic, but they, the writer has a tendency to mix them in a way that then muddies the image. Uh, and I feel like the only thing I can do is to come as a reader of that prose and go, okay, this is my experience, not as a writer and what I do in my own work, but as a reader and I can explain to you how this sentence worked for me or didn't work for me. Would, would it make you feel better if we told you that literal didn't used to mean literal before it changed to figurative, so it- Really, what did it mean? It, it, the original sense was of or relating to text, written, right. writing. And, and so the literal that we all love to defend or is, is, is self kind of a rank interloper. You can think of it that way if it, but that could just make you more unhappy. No, I'm furious. Or, right, okay, keep that fury. <laughs> I'm filled with rage. I, just, a, I love a, those. A I, re I remember a high school teacher who said that Zelda Fitzgerald literally lost her marbles. And that filled me with such joy imagining Zelda Fitzgerald it's literally It's possible that she did. I mean, it's true. I'm sure she. The record's unclear. Right, right. uh, it's like something Zelda down. would do, chasing right. the marbles across yeah. down the stairs. Yeah. Very careless, that woman. <laughs> right. 
Uh, we are at the museum we, as they're going down around the. <laughs> we, we are just about out of time because we've reached our hour point. If we did not get to anybody's question, uh, I'm very sorry. Uh, but once, once again, thank you both for coming on and even more so for writing this, this lovely, uh, lovely book. Oh, thank you so much. It's been a, it's been such a, such a pleasure to talk to you guys. And no one ever says that to me. Neil. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a dream to be asked about adverbs and, and word choice and, uh, and I'll forgive you for the piece of literally information. Okay. That's all right. And I would just interject here that anyone who's watching who really enjoyed these stories and assuming that you did if you're you're watching this, um, Elizabeth has a number of other books that are uh, still available and in print. And if I were to recommend one, it would be her previous novel, Bowl Away, which is about a subject that is near and dear to me. And um, I think it's an outstanding book and a, a further example of how you, uh, you master language and also awesome character names. There's some really great character names in that book. All from the genealogy. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great to see you. Great to see you. Bye-bye.